every HMI application out there is operated by a user or a group of users and typically different users will have different skill sets. Since a typical HMI application usually consists of a mix of standard operational controls like starting and stopping the machine, more advanced maintenance controls like for example setting up the screen network configuration or possibly even highly advanced controls like servo positioning parameters or PID control values, it makes sense to group users with similar skills into user groups and assign a set of specific HMI permissions to each group. This process of assigning users, user groups and permissions or authorizations to an HMI application is called user administration and it forms the main topic of this section. The main benefits of adding user administration to your HMI application are twofold. Firstly, adding a user administration can make your line or machine safer to operate by assigning authorizations to person safety critical tasks, like for example referencing servo drives or bypassing safety circuits for maintenance purposes. Secondly, by implementing a user administration, you have the possibility of greatly increasing the efficiency of your machine by only allowing users with the proper authorization levels to manipulate certain important aspects of your machine. If, for example, a person without the correct authorization would change PID values of a cooling tunnel of an ice cream production line, then this could lead to incorrect temperatures, resulting in a lot of downtime and, well, a lot of melted ice cream. Not exactly the desired outcome for the ice cream manufacturer. In these next few lectures, we are going to add a fully functional user administration to the application using the following steps. First, we are going to define the user groups and authorizations or permissions for each group. In the next step, we are going to configure users for each user group. After that, we will add security authorizations to screen objects like push buttons or parameter fields. In our final step, we are going to visualize the current active user in the information bar of the template. To guide us through these steps, I have created a PDF file with an overview of the users, user groups and authorizations for our HMI application. This PDF is attached to the resource section of this lecture and I would highly recommend that you print it out or you keep it open on your computer while working your way through the lectures of this section. That's all I have for this short section overview. Let's dive straight into the next lecture and start by adding user groups and authorizations to our HMI application. In this first lecture on user administration, we are going to start by creating user groups and adding specific permissions or authorizations as they're called in TIA portal to the application. Then in our next lecture, we are going to continue the implementation by creating users for those user groups. So let's get to it. The purpose of creating user groups is to define a group of users with similar skills. Each user group will then receive a certain set of authorizations. With these authorizations, each user group is limited to manipulating only certain functions or parameters of the HMI application. For example, the operator group might be limited to using standard buttons like starting and stopping the machine, resetting machine faults and loading new recipes. A maintenance group, for example, could have the rights to make changes to the panel setup like calibration or network configuration, while an engineering group might have access to setting up servo parameters or PID control values. If we have a look at the user administration that we've defined for our application, we can see that we have defined three user groups, operators, technicians, and administrators. For our operator group, we have defined three users, three operators, each with a specific username and password. We have defined two technicians for the technicians group and one administrator for the administrator group. On top of that, we have defined three authorization levels for our machine, operation, maintenance and supervision. And we have assigned one or more of these authorizations to each group. The operator group is only authorized to operate the machine, so it has only the operation level assigned to it. Technicians are allowed to operate the machine and to conduct maintenance operations on the machine. And finally, the administrator has the same rights as the technicians 
and on top of that, the rights to supervision control of the machine. Now that we've had a quick overview of the structure of our user administration, let's start by adding user groups to our application. To open our user administration configuration, we go to the tree structure on the left and we click on user administration. You guessed it right. You can see that we have two tabs here in the top right corner, the users and the user groups. Since we are starting with the user groups, let's click on that. You can see that our total work area is divided into two smaller areas, where the top area is used to configure the user groups and the bottom area is used to configure the authorizations. We are going to start with the user groups. Here we need to add an operators, a technicians and an administrators group. The administrators group is already configured by default as you can see. We are just going to rename it to administrators. Then for our second group, let's create the technicians group. And finally, the operators group. For our display names, we use the same names as the group names. So we select all three names here, Ctrl C to copy, we select the first row of the display names and Ctrl V to paste. Now for the authorizations. Here we are going to add operation, maintenance and supervision. Let's take the same order as we've done before. So we start by adding the supervision authorization, then maintenance, and finally operation. We are again using the same display names, so let's copy them over. Finally, let's change the comments here on the right to reflect our changes. So now that we have defined our groups and created our authorizations, the only thing left to do is to assign those authorizations to our user groups. We start with the administrators group. An administrator is typically defined as the highest level of user, a person who has full control over the HMI application, like a software engineer or a plan supervisor. These users normally have the rights to operate the line, work with maintenance functions, and carry out supervision work on the HMI if needed. So for the administrators group, we select all authorizations. They are already selected by default, so we leave it like this. Now for the technicians group, a technician is normally able to operate the machine and part of their work consists of performing maintenance operations on the machine, so we assign maintenance and operation authorizations to them. Finally, for our operators group, we assign the operation authority. This is already assigned as you can see, so we leave it like this. Operators normally work with basic line controls like starting, stopping and resetting the machine, but they should not have access to maintenance and supervision functions on the panel. Now to finalize the whole setup here, let's write some comments here on the right for the user groups. So that brings us to the end of this lecture. In this lecture, we've taken our first step towards implementing a functional user administration in our application by creating three user groups, administrators, technicians, and operators, and assigning authorizations to each group. In our next lecture, we're going to continue building the user administration by configuring users for each user group. Welcome back. 
In our previous lecture, we have defined three user groups for our application. Operators, technicians, and administrators. Furthermore, we have defined three authorization levels, operation, maintenance, and supervision. And we've assigned these authorizations to our user groups. In this lecture, we are going to build upon our previous lecture by introducing users to the application. If we have a quick look at our user administration structure, remember you guys downloaded this PDF in the first lecture of this section, you can see that we have defined three operator users, two technician users, and one administrator user for our application. Guys, this user structure is just a user setup that I've created as an example. Normally the setup is dependent on the number of users that will use your HMI application and the role of each user. So just keep in mind that this setup is only an example, nothing set in stone. We are going to start by adding the three operators with usernames OPER01, 02 and 03 with corresponding passwords 1001, 1002 and 1003. Afterwards we will add our two technicians with username TECH01 and TECH02 and with passwords 2001 and 2002. Finally, we will add our administrator with username admin and password 3001. So back to our user administration. We are still on the user groups tab here in the top right. So let's switch over to the users tab. And here at the top left under the users area, we start adding our operator users. So let's just rename the existing default username here with oper01. And as a password, we enter 1001. As you can see, we need to confirm our password one more time here. So we do that. Our second operator has the username OPER02 and 1002 as a password. Finally, we enter OPER03 as our third operator with the password 1003. Now it's time for our technicians tech01 and tech02 with passwords 2001 and 2002. And finally, we add our administrator with username admin and password 3001. So now we've added all our users, but we haven't assigned them to the correct group yet. So we select each user from top to bottom, and we assign for each user the correct user group below. So for the three operators, we assign the operator group. The two technicians we assign to the technicians group. And finally, we assign the administrator to the administrators group. Now we're done with assigning each user to a group. Let's finalize this setup by completing the comment section here on the right. Before we conclude this lecture, let's have a quick look at the configuration of a user. What's interesting for us here is the automatic logoff option together with the logoff time. As a default, this option is enabled with the logoff time of 5 minutes. When this option is enabled, the user will be automatically logged off 5 minutes after logging on. This doesn't mean that the HMI screen will log off like a Windows or anything like that. It just means that after 5 minutes the application will have no active user and more important, no active authorizations. So after 5 minutes all buttons, parameters 
and other objects that have been configured with an authorization level cannot be manipulated anymore by a user. To manipulate these buttons, parameters, objects again, a user will need to log on again with a username and a password that grants him or her the necessary authorizations to manipulate those objects. I normally leave this automatic log off enabled here because it's always the safer strategy to log off a user automatically after a certain time has expired. Let's assume, for example, that this automatic log off option is disabled. If now, for example, an administrator logs on to the HMI and forgets to log off manually, then it's possible that a different user with a lower authorization level comes along afterwards and manipulates functions on the HMI that are not part of his authorization. This can create unwanted production stops, like for example a crash on the line, because servo parameters were changed to incorrect values. We've reached the end of the lecture. So far we have created users, user groups and authorizations. Now that we have everything set up, we are going to use the next lecture to assign the different authorizations to buttons, parameters and other objects on the screens of our application. In our last two lectures, we have configured the user administration by adding users, user groups and authorizations to our HMI application. If we would run the application now, any user would be able to manipulate all the objects like buttons and parameters on the panel. The reason is of course that we haven't configured the authorizations for our buttons, parameters and other objects yet. So that's what we're going to do in this lecture. We're going to work our way through all the screens and we're going to define which authorization level to assign to which button, parameter, etc. So let's start with our template. Our screen navigation buttons here don't need any authorization level because navigating between the main screens does not interfere with the machine's functionality in any way. Where we do need to assign authorizations is here for our start and stop buttons. Only users with an operation authorization are allowed to start and stop the machine. To add an authorization to an object, we first click on the object and in the properties, we go to the security property all the way at the bottom here. Under runtime security, we can set the authorization level for this object. If we open now the list here on the right, you can see that we can choose between three authorization levels. Operation, Maintenance or Supervision. These are of course the authorizations that we've created in a previous lecture. For this button, we assign the Operation authorization. This button can only be manipulated by a user with Operation authorization. Now we assign the same authorization for our Stop button. Apart from the screen navigation, there are no other controllable objects on our template screen, so we are done here and we close it. Now let's open our screens one by one and add authorizations where needed. In our process overview screen, the only objects that can be manipulated are our parameters. These parameters are part of the standard operation of the machine, so we can either assign an operation authorization to them one by one, or, and this way is much faster, we can select all of the parameters first by holding down the shift key and clicking on each one of them, and then going to the common security properties here and assigning the operation authorization to all of them. That was fast, right? So that's it for our process overview screen. Let's open our alarm screen. Here we have one reset button at the bottom, two screen jump buttons at the top, and finally the alarm view itself. The screen jump buttons at the top only jump to other screens. They don't interfere with the machine, 
so we're not assigning any authorizations to these. Our alarm view object only displays alarms in its current configuration, so we don't need to add an authorization here either. The reset button on the other hand does interfere with the functionality of the machine. Alarms are an important aspect of troubleshooting the application, so it makes sense that only users with an operation authorization are allowed to reset alarms. To add an authorization to the reset button, we first select the button and under security properties, we assign the operation authorization. And that's it for our alarm screen. Now let's move on to our alarm buffer screen. On our alarm buffer screen, we have a return button and an alarm view object. Neither of them require a specific authorization because they don't interfere with the machine's functionality. The same goes for our next screen, the diagnostic screen. The return button here at the top only returns to the previous screen, and the diagnostics view only contains buttons to navigate through the different diagnostic pages. So on to our next screen the recipe screen. Here we do have objects that need a certain level of authorization assigned to them. The recipe view contains all the data records and manipulation of those data records is possible within the recipe view. Since data record values can be extremely important for the proper functioning of a machine or a line, we are only allowing users with a supervision authorization to control this recipe view object. The same goes for our button here on the top right side of the recipe view. As you might remember, this button is used to load a recipe. Again, we use the supervision authorization here. That's it for our recipe screen. For our final screen, which is the settings screen, we have not created any content yet. It is still empty and adding content to this screen will be the main focus of the next section of this course. For now, this screen is empty, so we cannot assign any user authorizations here yet. Ok guys, we've gone through all the screens of our application now and we've assigned the correct authorizations for the buttons, parameters and other objects of each screen. As I've mentioned before, these authorizations are not set in stone, they are only used here as an example. For your application, they could be different. In our next lecture, we are going to visualize the currently logged on user on the information bar of our template. It's going to introduce an exciting new feature of TIA Portal, so I can assure you guys, you do not want to skip this next lecture. In our previous lectures, we've configured the user administration for our application. In this lecture, we are going to display the active user on the information bar of our template using the following steps. In our first step, we are going to start by creating two new local tags for the application. The first local tag will be used for the username and the second local tag for the user group number. In our second step, we are going to write the active user and user group information to these two tags using a very cool feature in TIA called a scheduled task. In our final step, we are going to display the name of the active user on the information bar of our template and we are going to change the color appearance of the username rectangle background depending on which user group is active. Don't despair, it will all make sense in a minute. So let's start with our first step, creating two local tags for username and user group. Under the HMI tags group, we go under the local tags group and we open the local template tags table. Here we are creating a new local tag of the type string called username. And another local integer called user group number. So that's done and we close the tag table again. In our second step, we are going to write to these two tags using a TIA portal feature called Schedule Tasks. You find the scheduled tasks here on the left side in the tree structure. So let's open this. No task has been created here yet, so let's create a new one with the name User Admin. 
Now we need to configure a trigger here. Let's open the trigger list and see what we can select here. Ah, there we go. User change. Let's select this for our trigger. In order to assign a function to this trigger, we need to go to the events connected to this task. So we expand our bottom window here, and under events, you can see that we can execute a function every time the task is updated. In our case, the task will be updated every time we have a user change, because this is the trigger that we have configured for this task. So when a user change occurs, we want to write the new username to our username tag and the new user group number to our user group number tag. To get the username from the HMI, we use the appropriately named function getUsername. The tag that we want to write our username to is the local tag username that we've just created in step 1. To get the user group number, we add the function get group number and we assign the local tag for user group number now our schedule task is configured every time a user change occurs a user logs on or off we are updating the username and user group number great now that the bulk of the work has been done in our first two steps we just need to add the username to the information bar of our template in our final step so let's close this task window here and let's open our template. The active username will be displayed all the way on the left side here of our information bar. The rectangle below the username will display a different color depending on which user group is active in the application. In order to display the username tag, which is a string data type, we need to use an I.O. field object. Luckily enough, we already have two I.O. fields present here on our information bar, namely our recipe number and name. So let's start with a copy of our recipe name. This will save us some time by not having to go through all the appearance settings again. So we copy and paste the recipe name and we drag it over here. Let's delete this placeholder name for our username first. And now we can position our new I.O. field correctly on the designated rectangle. Now that our text is in the right position, let's go and change the tag assigned to this I.O. field. So we go to the properties. And under general, we assign the correct tag, which is our local tag, username. Due to the lack of space, we're only going to display 6 characters instead of 8. And under text format, we are changing the horizontal alignment to centered. Now we use the left and right arrow keys on the keyboard to nicely position the text in the middle of the rectangle. We need to make the text a little less wide here because the I.O. field is sticking out on the left side of the screen border. Any object that does not fit within the screen borders will not be displayed in runtime. An important little detail to remember. So we go to layout properties, we remove the fit object to contents, and we change the width to 70. Now our whole I.O. field fits on the screen. Let's reposition it a little bit. And there we go. Finally, we are going to change the color of the rectangle beneath the text, depending on which user group is active. To work with the rectangle more comfortably, without the username text being on top of it, let's make the text layer invisible. There, that's easier to work with. Now to change the color appearance of the rectangle, we first click on the rectangle and we go to the Animations tab. Here we configure a new appearance animation under the display group. The tag that we want to use here is our local tag user group number.
Now we need to select which values of our tag will represent which color. In order to know which user group has which number assigned to them, let's quickly open our user administration. Here under user groups, you can see that our administrators have the group number one, our technicians have group number two, and the operators have group number three. When no users are logged on, the group number will be zero. So we have four group numbers in total, ranging from zero to three. Back to our template. Let's add our four group numbers right here. So 0, 1, 2, and 3. For group number 0, no users locked on, we assign our custom light gray color. For group number 1, which are the administrators, we assign an orange color. For group number 2, the technicians, we assign a bluish color. And finally, for the operators, group number three, we assign a green color. That's it for our rectangle here. We can now make our text layer visible again. Well, let's run our simulator and have a small taste of all the work we've done in the lecture. Let's go to the process overview screen, for example, and let's try to change a parameter a login window pops up. So far, so good. Let's try to log on as a technician user. So let's take, for example, the technician with username tech01 and password 2001. Now we press on OK. And you can see that on the left side of our information bar, our username is displayed and the rectangle below the username displays the color blue, which is the color we assigned to the technician's group. Now if we would wait for 5 minutes now, then you would see that the user will be locked off automatically, the username will disappear on the information bar, and the rectangle below the username will display a light gray color again, indicating that no one is locked on anymore. So that's it for this lecture. We have successfully displayed the username and visualized the user group number by means of a color on the information bar. So that's another section crossed off our list. This section was all about user administration. We started the section by defining users, user groups, and authorizations. Afterwards, we added authorizations to buttons, parameters, and other screen objects where needed for every screen of the application. By adding user administration to our application, we have secured certain functions and controls of the HMI runtime application. And by doing so, we have made the application safer and more reliable to work with.